All right. We're looking at chapter four, and these are enthymemes. And then we have some other arguments that we have in here in this section. The enthymeme is, uh, here's the Greek word, it's in Mema, is used frequently in the scriptures, and we're going to define it. Copy defines it for us. Uh, it, we need to define what we're talking about. It's an argument which is stated incompletely, so it's an incomplete argument, and uh, with part being understood only in the mind, and this is uh, from this word for in the mind. Now, here's Merriam-Webster's definition of it, and it's from these two Greek words, or this word, uh, to keep in the mind. So the N is, the epsilon nu e N is N, and then this is in the mind. And so we come back up here now. It's also used, sometimes it's used, or as a rhetorical device in uh, based on probability inductive logic. Now we'll come back to this later in uh, just, just a little bit in our chapter on inductive logic, inductive arguments. And so we'll do it just a little bit. We won't develop it the way it normally is. Though. So it's used uh, as a rhetorical device and yeah, I believe it's used as a rhetorical device in both uh, in both senses. That's with inductive and deductive logic. We'll, we'll see this as we develop this. There are three different kinds of enthymemes. There's the first order and the second order and the third order. All right, let's define what these are. A, a syllogism, a categorical syllogism, has a major premise, minor premise, conclusion. Well, the first order, the major premise is not stated, but you have the minor premise and conclusion. Well, we have three terms in a syllogism, and each of those terms is used twice. So if we have the minor premise conclusion, we have both terms that are in the major premise in the other parts, as that is in the conclusion and in the minor premise. So we can reconstruct our major premise. Any question about that? That's in a nutshell. We'll, we'll come back to this. We'll elaborate on much more detail in just a few minutes. All right. That's copy page 242. Kofi also on this has a second order in its name. It's one in which the only the major premise and conclusion are say the minor premise is omitted. So we could have that a major premise conclusion. We need to reconstruct our minor premise. And of course, if we have the major premise and the conclusion, the conclusion has the minor term and the major term. And the major premise has the middle term and the major term. So the minor premise has a minor term, which is in the conclusion. It has the uh, middle term, which is in the, in the major premise. So we can reconstruct it. Let's go back to the first order. The first order we have the major premise is not stated. The minor premise has a, has a minor term and the middle term in it. And the conclusion has the major and minor terms. So the minor, the major premise has the middle term and the, and the major term. The major term is in the conclusion, and the middle term is in the minor premise. So we can reconstruct the major premise from that. Does that make sense? Once we see how to construct an argument, we can see how to reconstruct uh, what's not given to us. Okay. The third order enthymeme is the conclusion is left unexpressed. We have the major premise and minor premise, and then we can reconstruct the conclusion. Well, it, it has the minor term and the middle term and the, and the major term in it. And so we can get the minor term from the mi major minor premise and the major term from the major premise and reconstruct our conclusion. And so once we have, if we have those two premises, we can get the conclusion, draw it. 
any question about it, we'll practice on these and let you see how to do this. So we'll do some practicing on it. All right. Now, we don't have any fully developed categorical syllogisms in the Bible, in the New Testament. And anywhere I know of in the scriptures at all, Old or New Testament. They do have enthymemes and enthymemes. Now, our problem with this is, why in the world would the Lord just give us a full-blown argument? And there's psychologically, it doesn't work well to do it that way. What works better if you're convincing, trying to convince people is to have an enthymeme. And we'll see this. But what happens is the, the listener thinks it through and reasons out the conclusion. Frequently we'll have the major premise, minor premise, but we'll leave that. And when we do that, we can draw the conclusion. And so when the audience draws their own conclusion, it becomes part of their thinking. And uh, it's, a, it's a point of what they call rhetoric. Now rhetoric is a word that's used in a bad sense, but in a good sense, it means to convince people. And so it can help to convince them to help to develop their faith. So we need to understand how to complete the enthymeme, and we'll give the disciple a tool which you can draw what are called necessary inferences. So this gets into our hermeneutics a little bit. So let's take a first order enthymeme and lay it out. It has a major premise unstated. It's elliptical, it's not stated. And the following argument illustrates the ease in which the major premise can be reconstructed. Now, right here, all S or N, that's your major premise, your minor premise, John Doe is a citizen of Oklahoma. Conclusion, John Doe is a citizen of the United States. So our, our major term is, a, it's, a prim, it's a predicate of the conclusion. It is a citizen of the United States. There's your major term. So it goes up here in this major premise. Right, right here. So we put a citizen of the United States. The middle term, middle term, the middle term is a citizen of Oklahoma. So we have a citizen of Oklahoma. That's your middle term. So this would draw the conclusion in. That's your middle term, a citizen of Oklahoma. And if when we put those together, we draw the major premise to, to be all citizens of Oklahoma are citizens of the United States. That's how we draw that conclusion. So that's, that's we reconstructed a major premise. So we can put this up here, all citizens of Oklahoma are citizens of the United States. That's what we'd have right here. That would be our major premise. Pretty straightforward. And of course, we have to understand how to construct syllogisms. Let's find out. Check your mic and see. Make sure it's muted, if you will, please. All right. So the the major premise is certainly true. And the syllogism is valid, it's properly constructed. If the minor premise is true, Joe was Joe John Doe is a citizen of Oklahoma, then the conclusion necessarily follows. It's necessary for the conclusion to be true. That's why it's called a necessary inference. Now we'll, we'll develop this term necessary in chapter six when we get to hypothetical syllogisms. It'll lay out more clearly what we mean by that. So this conclusion is necessary. It's necessary for it to be true, okay? And so that's why the older logicians called it a necessary inference, right? Now, here's one. Let's take one now that's a little more down to earth and help us a bit here. First order, Enthymame illustrates how to know that the first day of the week observance of the Lord's Supper is at least authorized, and I'll put commanded here. All S or N, all, and the, uh, S means sufficient, N means necessary. 
when we get into chapter six, uh, I'll lay this out well, but what those mean. That's why I've used those word, letters. The minor, minor premise is the church at Troas are those who partake of the Lord's Supper on the first day of the week, Acts 20, verse 7. So that's our minor premise. The conclusion is the church at Troas are those who obey God. Now, the minor term is the church at Troas. That's your minor term, and that's right here, the church at Troas. Okay. Now then. Those who obey God is a major term because it's a predicate of the conclusion. So it goes up where in is up here. I want to put it here. Those who obey God, I'm gonna I want to mess with my syllogism. I'll, I'll do it in just a minute. Those who obey God, that is in. That's your now then. And uh, we could color it. Uh, well, I will go ahead and color it. I'll color it. Color it blue. Right? Those who obey God. Make that blue. Let's kind of see what we've done. Then I come down here from a middle term. And so the church at Troas is your minor term. Those who partake of this right here is your middle term, so I'm going to color it red. Color it red. All right. And I'll lift it up here and put it right here in place of S. So just, that's our major premise. All those who partake of the Lord's Supper on the first day of the week are those who obeyed God. How, how do, you, do you see that? And so now we can now get authority. This shows why we have authority for taking the Lord's Supper on the first day of the week. We don't have authority to take of it any other time. So this is one of our reasoning. This is a necessary inference for us. All right, any questions? Right. Okay, now, so our conclusion is all those who took the Lord's Supper on, on the first day of the week are those who obeyed God. All right, so we have here, uh, so all those who partake of the Lord's Supper on the first day of the week are those who obeyed God. Well, that's telling us that God has commanded that. That's by implication. Now, let's look at Colossians 3.17. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all what? Remember? Help me out, somebody. In the name of the Lord. In the name of the Lord. All right. Now then, let's look at 1 Corinthians 4.17. So open your New Testaments to that passage, and you'll see something very interesting. I had mine open, and I closed my Bible. Okay, First Corinthians four seventeen. Now, in First Corinthians four seventeen, Paul wrote. He said, "Here for this cause I was sent unto you, Timothy, who is my beloved and faithful child in the Lord, who shall put you in remembrance of my ways which are in Christ." Now, listen to the last part. Even as I teach everywhere in every church. So what he was, Timothy was going to teach was the same thing Paul taught everywhere. So what does this tell us? Well, it tells us that everything Paul taught, he taught everywhere. So he taught the same thing everywhere he preached. Well, that's pretty reasonable. So he taught everywhere the same thing he was having Timothy to teach. All right, let's go to 1 Corinthians 14, 33 and 34. All right. 14, 33, and 34, he says, For God is not a God of confusion, but of peace. In the American Standard, it ends, it ends the sentence there and begins a new sentence. The King James does not. I think the American Standard is right, as in all the churches of the saints. So what instruction I'm giving you, I gave that same instruction in all the churches. 
he goes on and says, let the women keep silence in the churches for it is not permitted them to speak, but let them be in subjection as also saith the law. So the law of Moses says the same thing. He's appealing back to the law of Moses. So here again, he taught the same thing in every church. Every church, this is taught in every church. All right? Any question? As in all the churches of the saints. Now let's go down here and let's look at another one. Do you have questions before I move on? Open your Bibles to Matthew 22. I'm sorry, Matthew 12, 22. Matthew 12, 22. When we look at this right here, Matthew 12, 22, we'll, we'll see Jesus is cast out a demon. All right. And I'm going to read 22 through 24 from the American Standard. Then was brought unto him one possessed with a demon, blind and dumb, or mute would be a better translation. And he healed him in so much that the dumb man or mute man spake and saw. And all the multitudes were amazed and said, Can this be the son of David? But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, This man does not cast out demons, but by Beelzebub, the prince of the demons. All right. So now let's look at the argument of the Pharisees here. Right. So they said, you have cast out demons by the power of Beelzebub. So they admitted, we got their minor premise by implication, they admitted he was casting out demons. You cast them out, yes, but by the power of Beelzebub. So Jesus is one who cast out demons. They admitted that. All right. And their conclusion is Jesus is one who cast out demons by the power of uh, by the power of Beelzebub. See their conclusion. Their conclusion is in verse 24. If one, any, any questions about that? Now let's reconstruct it. Let's put this in right here. Right here is your minor term, Jesus. And there's your minor term here. I'm not even going to highlight that. I'll leave it black. All right. Uh, one who cast out demons by the power of Beelzebub. All right. I'm going to make that. I'm going to make that blue. I'm going to pick it up and put it up here in the. And we'll have here. Up here. R. There's your major term right there, blue. Now, we come down here, we can get our one who cast out demons, and we'll make that red. That is your middle term. And we have the word all modifying it, all, all. So we'll change that one to all. All who cast, and I'll make that the verb correct. All who cast out demons are are those who cast out demons by the power of the other. But correct the grammar, make it perfectly correct. So what they're saying is all who cast out demons are those who cast out demons by the power of the ultimate. Is that clear? What what their argument has to be? Any question? Now, Jesus then replies to them, and let's read on. And knowing their thoughts, he said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought into desolation, and brought to desolation, every house divided against itself can or shall not stand. So Satan wouldn't cast out demons because he'd be divided against himself. He's given an argument to answer their claim. And then he says in verse 26, and if Satan casteth out Satan, he is divided against himself, then how shall his kingdom stand? Verse 27, now he's going to make a counter argument. And if I by Beelzebub cast out demons, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore shall they be your judges. And so they claim their sons cast out demons. 
okay? Your sons. And so there's your minor term, your sons. And uh, so they're claiming that they cast out demons. Say they are those who cast out demons. And so those who cast out demons, there's your middle term. So I'm going to make that red. And, uh, and then all those, all to make it all, those who cast out demons. And wouldn't the major premise just be the same thing as what you had in the previous argument? Yes. Uh, and we, we can see it right here. All those who cast out demons are those who did it by the power of bells. But that's correct. Thank you. I was re reconstructing it, but uh, you're correct. So let's just put it in there. We've, he's already developed that, and yeah. that's his your premise. So by whom do your sons cast them out? Your sons are those who cast out demons by the power of who? They claim their sons cast them out. So by their own major premise that their argument implied, their sons were casting out demons by the power of Beelzebub, because everybody cast out demons by the power of Beelzebub. See how he caught them? He couldn't de de defeat the Lord. So that's their problem. Anybody, everybody see how, how masterful the Lord was? All right. So that's that's what we see. Now I gotta erase and do all this. Ah, what happened here? So really his argument is a dilemma also. We'll get to dilemmas in chapter nine. And so they've got two alternatives. They can either give up the argument about Jesus or they can admit that they're and their sons, that would be their disciples. And that sons is probably used for their disciples who claim to cast out demons. That they're doing it by the power of Beelzebub as well too. So they're they're in a, between, as we say in Oklahoma, between a rock and a hard place. That's called a dilemma. Any questions? Yeah, if I may, can I back up just one second? Sure. Uh, as also saith the law, uh, where where do you find that? Your earlier reference, Colossians three seventeen. As, as also saith the law. Now that was, uh, as also saith the law was in First, Cor First Corinthians 14, excuse me. In First Corinthians 14. Yes, sir. Uh, where did I, where did I have? What reference in the law was that? It's in First Corinthians right here. It's this right here. Oh, it is. Yeah, but, but where in the law does it say that? It says it in principle in the law. Uh, and it goes back, I believe, uh, to the Garden of Eden even. The law included the book of Genesis. To start, mm -hmm. I believe in the Garden of Eden. You have my book on the role of women? Yes, sir. Uh, I think I document all of this and show where it fits in. Good enough, and, I'll take a look. Thank you, sir. Hey, it's got a scripture index, so that, that should help you there. I'm sorry, okay. I can't. But I believe it's probably Genesis 3. It's like LinkedIn. 
I think Genesis 2 came to mind for me, but I thought, yeah, that might not be it. So I thought I'd check. Thank you. So right here now, we see how Jesus traps them. And they make this argument, and they get trapped by their own argument. Because when they take their major premise, it, it destroys them. They, they're dishonest. They're just not honest. There's some people that aren't honest. And it, it grieves God that they're not honest. It grieves me that they're not honest. But when I see dishonest people, I, I know that they're probably not going to listen to the truth. But I, I'll, I'll preach to them and teach to them what I can and try to be as kind as I can be to them. But I know some people are just not going to obey. But I don't know their hearts. So as, as one who doesn't know hearts, I have to assume that they might be honest and I'll go on and teach. I believe that's what you should do. Any questions? We go to our second order in the main. And uh, where the minor premise is suppressed, but the major premise conclusion are there. So here, we see in Romans 3.23, all men have sinned. And so here, all have sinned. And we don't have a minor premise to it. The Jews are those who have sinned, Romans 3.9. So our major term, it's the end term. The major term is the conclusion, the predicate of the conclusion, okay? Those who have sinned. This is, I want to leave the Romans 3 9 off. So that right there, and I'm going to make it, I'll make it a different color. Let's make it, let's make it blue again, like we did earlier. So I'm going to put that. So that's, and those who have sinned is this up here. That would be blue. I'll just lay everything out in color, okay? We'll color it. All right. And then all men, men, make that red. And that's your middle term. There's your middle term. Now that middle term is going to go right here. So that's where it goes. And the Jews, so we'll say the Jews. And then this would be, let's make it purple. So we can do it. And that would subject of the conclusion. So now we have our middle term. And we have to change this to R from the singer is, but that's okay. The Jews are men. Well, we already knew that. It's not, we didn't draw any new conclusions on it. But uh, that's the assumption he's making. All men are those who have sinned. The Jews are men, therefore the Jews are those who have sinned. Well, that's pretty evident. That's his minor premise. Does that make sense? We don't have very many of these. These aren't very helpful. The second order is not very helpful in interpreting the Bible. So kind of keep that in mind. So we won't be doing a lot of those. So let's do this. What about the case of some Jews are women? Are, are we thinking the minor premise is some Jews are men? I, I think uh, I think uh, right here the word man is used for mankind in general. Okay, all right. Context. I can buy that. Thank you. All right. Now, the we don't have this minor premise very often. Once in a while, it can help us, but a lot of times what we'll have is is we'll have a uh, we'll have the major premise, minor premise, and we'll draw the conclusion or we can develop a generic, a general principle from a first order, right? So let's go back here, like this one right here. Jesus developed a generic principle that they had to have uh, assumed, and it destroyed them because we see what they're assuming, what assumption is based upon his, if we take his minor premise conclusion, we can reconstruct his major we can see what assumption he's making. Sometimes people don't realize what the assumptions they're making are. And sometimes it would really help if people could really understand this and re reconstruct their assumptions. 
So if you see, if you were debating someone or just discussing with them, reading what they're written, and they give you a, a, a conclusion and a minor premise, you can reconstruct their major. All right, let's go in where we have a third order and we can use this, this is powerful. A third order, we have the conclusion omitted, but we have the major and minor premises. So right here, I want us to put, and we're going to develop the whole plan of salvation right here. I don't believe the plan of salvation is explicitly in one passage of scripture, but it's in the Bible. So we're going to use a third order intimacy. We have the major premise, minor premise, and conclusion, conclusion not stated. We have these others now right here. My major premise is all those who are baptized in a scriptural manner, those who have repented. Acts 2.38, repent ye and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ unto the remission of your sins. Ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So all those who are baptized in a scriptural manner, those who have repented. That's what it tells us in Acts 2.38. Does everyone see that? Now, let me let me caution you. Uh, I develop a, uh, some real important in, information in one of the appendixes. And when we finish here, I'll go back and show you that appendix we're getting. And we got another 15 minutes or so. Maybe we can finish this. The Ethiopian eunuch is one who was scripturally baptized in a scriptural manner. I think we would all agree with that. So that's our that's our uh, minor premise. So now then, let's get here. Let's get our minor term, and I'm going to make it. I'm going to make it blue. Let me make it blue. I haven't, I haven't been consistent all the way through with my colors, but at least you can see I've, I've tried to get it here. And here, that will be C. That's your minor term. It's the subject of the conclusion. All right, now my major term is right here, all those who have, re have, have repented. So I'm gonna make this one red, make it red. So I'm gonna bring it down here. Say. Okay, wait a second now. All those are baptized. For those who have repented. Uh, it, I've got it wrong. Uh, sorry. Are those who have repented? That's, I make that red. I, I make too, too much of the material. Okay. Thank you. And I change the star. Or is it's singular? And I'll change this to one. Okay. We now have proven, although it's not in the text of the Bible, it's not explicitly there, it's implicitly in the text of the Bible from an intimacy that he repented. Does that make sense? You like that? Oh, it doesn't get you excited? Okay. <laughs> so now well, I've proven that he, and he, I've proven by logic that he repented because he was baptized in a scriptural manner, and everybody baptized in a scriptural manner had also repented, Acts 2 38. This is what my brethren have preached ever since I was knee high to a grasshopper. I heard it. That the plan of salvation. And gospel preachers are preaching, they were preaching before I was born. I will read their writings. All right, any questions? All right, so let's take it. There we have it. Well, now we're not through with it. Let's go again. All right, let's take. And I don't know, we, I think we have time. We could add to this the other plan, steps in the plan of salvation. All right? We could add confession and other things, all of the steps. We could add belief. 
All right, all those who are scripturally baptized are those who believe. Then we put the Ethiopian eunuch in there. But let's go to Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. Here's an argument, major premise, all those who are saved are those who are baptized. Mark 16, 15, and 16, those of Ephesians 2, 8 through 10 are those who were saved. All right, so let's take our major term, our middle term, I see, middle term, and it's right here, those who are saved. I won't highlight it, I'll just show it right here. There's your middle term. Your major term are those who are baptized. So I am gonna make this a different color. I'm gonna make it blue. There's my major term. I'm gonna bring it down here. There's your major term. It's a predicate of the conclusion right there. And now we're gonna take our minor term those are Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. All right, we're going to make this red. And we'll go with that. Here. And there we are. And I'll change the, the verb from singular to plural. And now we're in business. I prove there implicitly those are Ephesians 2, 8 through 10 are those who are baptized. Any question? All right, nobody has a wow or anything, okay? All right, well, I'll tell you what let's do. I wanna go back. I'm gonna get rid of these right here. We're gonna change that. All right, we're gonna go down here. We got those same people. We got the same minor premise, all right? All those who are saved are those or have remission of sins are those who have repented. All right, Acts 2 38. So we equate being saved with having remission of sins. If we can equate those two, then my argument is sound. So now then let's get our major term, those who repented, who have repented. And again, I'll make this, I'll make it blue again. I think I've been making it blue, it doesn't matter. I got a different shade of blue there. I hit them a different thing. That's what be your major term. It's a predicate of the conclusion. And now let's come in here. We have our minor term. Those are Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. The same minor term we had a moment ago on just a few in the last one. We'll make it red. We'll bring it down here. And we change this from singular to plural, R. Let me back up. So I now just proved that not only did those of those of Ephesians 2, 8 through 10 were they baptized, but I proved they also repented. We see in Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, for well, by grace have you been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works that no man should glory or boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God has prepared that we should walk in them. So this passage has grace in it, and it has faith in it. But now we have put into it by implication repentance and baptism. So we have faith, repentance, and baptism. Grace, faith, uh, repentance, and baptism in there. So those, it makes the conclusion to be those of Ephesians 8, uh, those who have repented. By implication, by necessary inference, shows the Ephesians had repented. Now then, let's, let's put another one in here in this same group. All right? And major premise, all those who are saved are those who have confessed, Romans 10, 9, and 10. Same minor premise now, those who are to it are those who are saved. So let's start out again. Those who are, have confessed, and that's your, we'll make that our major term, that's our major term. All right. Major term, that's a predicate of the conclusion. And now we have the minor term is right here. And 
and there it is, and we'll make it red. I didn't want to go out and make it made red, doesn't matter, but we just we just slow flow through here. As consistent as I can. Close of Ephesians 2 at you 10 R, we change this to an R. To have confessed. So now I've proven that those of Ephesians 2 8 through 10 had the grace of God, they had faith, they believed, they repented, they confessed, and they were baptized by implication. Are there any questions? You don't get excited about this like I do. I think this is this is really important here. Woohoo! No, I appreciate oh, that in there. I like it. So right here, those who preach to 8 to 10 had God's grace, they had faith, they had repented, they had confessed, they had been baptized. I could also prove they love God and they love their neighbor. I can add those in there and extend this and say that they love God and they love their neighbor as themselves. Because I can prove that's essential to being saved. What do you think? Any questions? So we've got all the plan of salvation right here. We've proven it by implication. I think the old preachers in the 19th century understood all of this. I think they understood it. I think that's that's where they derive this, this information. All right. Now we've got time. It's only 8.06, so we got another approximately another 10 minutes. I want to do one other thing. Let's do this. Bullinger, Bullinger, I pronounce that Bullinger, G as a J almost, refers to the first and second order enthymemes as enthymema, and the third order enthymeme as syllogismus. And these are uh, the transliteration of Greek words. In syllogismus, that's your third order, the premises are stated, but the conclusion is omitted. So that's what he calls syllogismus. On an enthymema, the conclusion is said, and one or more of the premises are omitted. So he says you can have one or more of the premises omitted if you just have the conclusion. So right here, remember this. If we only have the conclusion, we only have two of the three pieces of information. We have the major term and the minor term. The minor term is the subject of the conclusion, and the major term is a predicate. That's all we have. We don't have our middle term. Since a valid or properly constructed categorical syllogism contains exactly three terms, conclusion contains two terms, two ter two thirds of the argument can be reconstructed from the conclusion. So the conclusion contains the major term and the minor term. Major term the predicate of the conclusion, the minor term being the subject of the conclusion. Now. The following conclusion will be used to illustrate this point. John Doe is one who is an Oklahoma citizen. That's our conclusion, all right? So what I want to do is John Doe, and that is your middle, that's your minor term, because that's in the minor premise. That's the subject of the conclusion, so it's in the minor premise. There, that's the, right? the one who is an Oklahoma citizen, that, and I'll make that blue, and that is your major term. That goes right up here. Oh, bring that down a bit. Now, all we need is that S term, the middle term. Now then, if a person is going to assert that conclusion, he affirms this conclusion, he affirms it, then he is giving us this much information here, the red and the blue up here. And all we need for him to make a good sound argument and prove his case, he needs to find a middle term that will fit in and prove his point. So what we can do is we know most of what he has to argue. And so the major term, we have it, 
And we have the minor term, we just don't have the middle term S. So uh, you, could, you could make S being uh, all men who reside in Oklahoma are Oklahoma citizens. That would be that would be that would be correct. And then John Doe resides in Oklahoma. Yeah. That would work. Or all those who are citizens of Oklahoma City. They, yeah. So there's a lot of ways you could prove that, and that's a good point. Or all those who are citizens of Tulsa, Oklahoma, or some other city in Oklahoma or town. Okay. And so, yes, we, there's several ways we could prove that point. And I have down here, all citizens of Tulsa are those who are Oklahoma citizens. And we could add any other Oklahoma town or city here, Tulsa, and I mean Tulsa, Oklahoma. I don't know if there's another Tulsa in the, in the world. I think I did a search to make sure there wasn't. So I, I put, well, if there is, we'd have to qualify it with Tulsa, Oklahoma. Oklahoma City, there's no other place called Oklahoma City anywhere I can find in the whole world. So I could put Oklahoma City, all cities of Oklahoma City. I think Tulsa is the same way. I don't know if there's another Tulsa. But whatever, we could still qualify with Tulsa, Oklahoma. Does that make sense? So there's more than one way that he might prove it. If he gives us a conclusion, we need a middle term that will prove his conclusion. If he's rational, he's going to come up with a middle term. If he doesn't come up with a middle term, and he's not being rational to assert his conclusion, he's just begging the question is assume what he's trying to prove. Are we making sense? You want to see what I'm saying? Yes, indeed. And so we see some bad reasoning on the part of various people. Now I'm going to. I'm going to unhighlight these because I don't want this is in my book, so I don't want it messed up. All right. All right. Now, we're pretty close to the end of what I want to quit. To complete a syllogism, the syllogism, the one who asserts the conclusion must supply, and I say must, he, he, it's, it's, he must do it to be sound, to be rational. A middle term that makes the argument valid is sufficient to imply the conclusion. And you gave us a good one. We, we gave Tulsa and Oklahoma City, or all Oklahoma citizens, see, so forth. The reader should be aware that the conclusion might be proven by several different ways. I have Tulsa and there's other, we could put other places, okay. And the middle term, S term, could be any subgroup of Oklahoma citizens. Okay, that's what I say here. When a person makes an assertion, he's giving you his conclusion of his argument. He is given the major term and the minor term of his argument. If he's rational, if he's rational, I'm going to make this red. I'm going to highlight if he's rational, he will give his middle term, the S term, and complete his argument. If he's unable to come up with a middle term, he's not rational. He cannot rationally accept the conclusion what he asserts. The middle term is what in logic is called a sufficient condition. Now we'll get to that in chapter six. It'll be much clearer once we cover chapter six. We'll develop it more fully. Now, in, in addition, Bullinger, he says this is an enthymema or enthymeme. In syllogismus, the premises are stated, but the conclusion is omitted. But in Entomema, the conclusion is stated in one or both, one or both of the, of the premises. So this is still called an Entomema by Bullinger and by one other source that I quote. So some will say, well, that's not an Entomema. It's It only has a conclusion. Right here is one fellow that claims they're the same, and this is a fellow named Bitzer. Uh, so we'll get back to this next week. Do you have questions? We're pretty much to the end of what I want to call a halt to the material. We have now justified the preaching of the plan of salvation, logically. What we've been preaching, what I've heard since uh, the 1940s. I was born in 43. I was listening to preaching when I was you know, very young, and I remember remember in the first, second grade listening to 
the gospel preacher get up and have old church sermons. And, and when I got, got to where I could read and write and could write, I'd bring a big chief writing tablet and I'd, I'd write on it with a pencil and I'd draw those charts, those preachers put up there, I'd sketch them off. And I'd take them home and I'd open my Bible and read the Bible, what they said, get my parents' Bible. I had, my parents gave me a, a New Testament, a little pocket New Testament, but I had, I, I'd get my parents' Bible and open it up. But I remember it, the you know, same thing, and they've been preaching it for a long time. And I believe it's sound. And I, I'm, I make no apologies for preaching the plan of salvation. All right, fellas, any questions? No, sir, sounds good. All right. What we're going to do is 